The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. We have yet to fully review the Republican National Committee's convention last week with Donald Trump, of course, being front and center and that extraordinary Thursday night White House speech accepting the nomination and really pushing up against not only culture and standards, but the law. Uh, Joe Camerano, political scientist from Providence College, has been my go-to guy to take a look at the, the way that both Democrats and Republicans are running their shows. Uh, here is a review, in case you missed it, of the Republican National Convention, and then we'll get in with Joe. Optimism. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. President Trump stood on the South Lawn of the White House and thanked the supporters who got him there. The fact is we're here and they're not. He then turned his attention to the man trying to keep him from spending another four years in the People's House. Joe Biden is weak. The president painted Biden as a puppet of the radical left who wants to defund the police. They will pass federal legislation to reduce law enforcement nationwide. No one will be safe in Biden's America. And he slammed the protests that have rocked the nation. The Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all, like Kenosha. Minneapolis, Portland, Chicago, and New York. While making no mention of the police shootings which triggered the unrest. Thousands of protesters will march on Washington today calling for police accountability, including the families of Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Marchers also protested outside the White House during the president's speech last night and confronted Trump supporters leaving the White House, including Senator Rand Paul. With the conventions now over, the real campaigning begins. President Trump will hold a campaign rally in New Hampshire this evening. While Joe Biden announced he will be returning to the campaign trail for in-person rallies after Labor Day. And so I uh, regroup with Joe Camerano, political science professor at Providence College. He's been kind enough to share his thoughts both for the DNC and the RNC. Um, and... I don't even know what the question is uh, to start. I, let, let's just go with the, what was your gut check about the entire week? Then we can talk about the president's Thursday address. A few things. Um, first, I think, you know, we talked about this last week about parties basically being so diminished in this era and that being a big problem. We saw that it was really a week of Trump and his followers who are Republicans, not Republicans who are embracing Donald Trump again. Uh, and so the speakers were an extraordinarily unusual set of Trump loyalists, particularly family and friends. And that's not normal, but it's also what we would expect. I think the second thing that we sort of glean from this is Trump believes that he has to increase his base. Um, and I think he's right about that. So the appeal was aimed at the wing of his party, the populist wing, the blue collar, white, non-college educated um, Republican. Uh, and they really lean very hard in that direction. And they're just crossing their fingers that that lean doesn't alienate. The third point I wanna make is that last week gave Republicans who focus on the economy and are a little less populist in their orientations, that basically forced them to think, can I swallow hard again and vote for Trump because he's gonna give me what I want in the economy. Mm. You know, the message was clear. It was, it was, we're going the populist route. We're gonna take George Wallace and Richard Nixon, put them into two, uh, add QAnon in the mix and cross our fingers that the people who are doing well because of our economic policy won't abandon us. The, the, the idea, you're talking about the lineup of speakers. I, I, I found it fascinating. This is, and last night I had Gary Sass, the uh, Hassefeld Institute um, uh, uh, leader there, and he has long been a Republican and a big money guy in the state, you know, when it comes to uh, revenue officer. He's a, you know, he's a smart guy. He's kind of a, 
kind of a wonky guy, but he's, he's very passionate about the idea that Donald Trump should not be elected. He's part of the Republicans who oppose Donald Trump. He's part of the Lincoln Project, which has been very, very active in fundraising and some really high level production together, um, you know, seizing on Trump and, and supporting Joe Biden. Um, he reflected as well on the, the lack of uh, traditional Republicans that are in the mix right now and that the party has become the Trump party. We get it. But it was glaring, Joe, that there was very, there, that, that the typical, I mean, Mitch McConnell barely spit out a video. You know, it was that you just didn't have that long list of national Republicans who are in play right now as part of the entire thing. Do you think the country got that? Well, first of all, the ratings weren't all that good for either party, a little less so for the Republican Party. So the people watching are either the politicos like us, people who have to do it for their job, or you know, people who are already very loyal Trump supporters. I, I think a lot of the Gary Sass types probably sat it out or began to watch it and began to tune it out. And so it really wasn't aimed at them. It was aimed at energizing people, hopefully in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, so that Trump can eke out a victory again. Mm. The you know, and, and you're right, Gary Sass is the perfect example of somebody who in any other year would be a slam dunk supporter of the Republican presidential candidate. That's the trick for the Trump uh, campaign. If they lose Gary Sass, it doesn't matter. He's in Rhode Island. Um, but how many Gary Sass types will he lose in Pennsylvania or Michigan or even in a place like Georgia uh, where, you know, he doesn't have a slam dunk chance of winning? So, you know, this is the balance. And this is why I keep saying Donald Trump destroyed the Democratic Party in 2016. In 2020, he's going to destroy the Republican Party. Talk to me about the, the list of prominent Republicans who, who are in office right now or play a role right now who were not there. Do you think America recognized that they were not there? Well, you know, I would say yes. But does it matter to them? Only partially yes. That, um, you know, the fact that there was no Bush or Larry Hogan or Mike DeWine, I, I, Mike DeWine may have made a brief appearance, I can't remember. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of kind of the country club Republicans that we all grew up with, those of us in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, you know, I, I just, that's the party of the past. And so I don't think they want to necessarily highlight that anymore, uh, at least the, Trump's, the Trump campaign doesn't. So they don't want bankers speaking or you know, banking interests speaking at this convention because that doesn't play well with populists. It's, it's, a, it's, it's I guess, in, in a way, it's just... It's you know, and I, I, the American people, I think, you know, we're so divided that, you know, the 35% who are going to vote for Trump no matter what, even if he started, you know, cannibalizing humans and eating them on screen, um, you know, that they're going to stay with him. It's, it's that 10 to 12% of people who like his deregulatory policy, but just can't stand the rest of his policies. Well, you that's, know... That's the issue. It, it used to be, you know, shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. Now it's cannibalizing whatever you said. When we come back, the specific Thursday evening White House uh, nomination acceptance from the president. When we come back with PC Professor Joe Camarano. Please stay with us. Back to my state of mind. PC Professor Joe Camarano with me. We're reviewing the Republican National Convention notes here. All right, uh, let's have it. Uh, Thursday night and the president at the White House, your, your, your professorial take on, on the difference between that and what we are A, used to seeing and B, should be seeing. It really struck me, the White House, um, as a backdrop for this. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it's almost like he desecrated what you might call civic, um, you know, religious space. The White House has never been used like this before. And there's a reason why, is that it's the people's house. And even though I've never been in the White House, I've been closed, but never in, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm a part of it. 
And he very explicitly said that now this is, we own this now, they don't. And that, that kind of division and using the White House to sort of develop an exclusionary message really was troubling. I think the second thing as an academic um, was I have never seen an incumbent president run against an incumbent before. Um, he's running against Joe Biden as if Joe Biden ha is the current incumbent. And that was striking again. It's unique. It's probably not inconsistent with the way Trump engages everything in his life. Um, you know, he thought of it and he's going to go with it, even if it's accurate or inaccurate. Uh, and then the third thing, um, you know, the symbolism of having maybe three masked people in a crowd of 2,000 and a lot of federal employees on the grounds in violation of the Hatch Act uh, really struck me as um, a certain arrogance that I don't think we've seen in the modern era of presidents. On, uh, on Friday of last week on, on my radio show on WPRO weekdays, three till six, of course, I, 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 had, I didn't say anything other than to just repeat over and over what I saw. And it was very interesting how, how the radio show went. Um, so what I said was uh, 1,500 plus people, shoulder to shoulder, most without a mask, listening to the nomination acceptance speech of the President of the United States, the person who is most in charge or responsible for the national response to COVID-19. Bang. And I repeated that over and over again, not to play with the audience, but just to, to, to say what was true. All of that is just true. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not opinion. It's not it's just true. And the visceral early reaction from the base on the phone lines, you're always bashing Trump, you're always bashing Trump. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, wait a second, I just, I just told you what was true. Um, and then of course it evens out, but, I, but my point is with a full body of phone lines, and I don't always judge the radio phone lines as the pulse of, of, of America you know, or the region. So you gotta be careful with this stuff sometimes, but People noticed it, people had opinions about it, and I'm telling you, it didn't fly with a lot of folks. It did not, I bet. He was trolling the media, but he may have hurt himself. I, well, I don't know, what, what, what's your projection about that? I, you know, it, it's just more evidence of what we're going to get. And today or yesterday we saw him tweeting about Portland and, you know, defending essentially, or at least not uh, condemning the kid in uh, Kenosha who murdered two protesters or shot three, I guess, um, you know, basically saying, well, of course, people are going to take the law into their own hands. I mean, and, and the idea of a U.S. Senator, Ron Johnson, going on national TV and saying, well, you know, vigilantes are, you know, a necessary thing with all the violence in the street. Um, I have to say, I never thought in this country, in my lifetime, I would have to hear and see and witness these sorts of statements coming from elected officials. It's, it's, it's really, really troubling as a political scientist. Yeah, but uh, going back to whether it re resonates with whether the, the image of yeah. all those folks, con look, there's not a state in the, in the country right now who by at least its COVID prescriptions allows a gathering of that size, indoor or outdoor. Um, there just isn't. And you, you get pushback from folks say, yeah, what about the protesters? Well, the protesters are also, you know, behaving in a terribly risky way. I know most of them are in masks. They were on the mall, uh, uh, you know, on Friday, but, they're, they're risking the virus transmission as well. That wrong does not match the wrong of what the president symbolically offered on Friday, on Thursday, right? I, I would agree. And, and most of the um, studies of these protests show that masking makes a difference when protesters are not wearing masks. They do spread, but when they are wearing masks, they don't as long as they stay outside. Um, you know, and a perfect example of this is Sturgis. 
uh, where you know the outdoor events were problematic, but the real problems that we're going to that we're going to see over the next two three weeks, uh, where all these motorcycle people went and got tattoos at night, went into bars at night, and 61% of all counties in the U.S. had someone at Sturgis. And so we're going to see an uptick probably in a, in a week or two. So it's not just the fact that people are gathering together. It's that they're gathering together without masks and they're doing things that are risky. Um, sitting and listening to a president drone on for 70 minutes, and it was a drone. It was a terrible speech. Um, is not the same as milling around or walking around or, you know, if you stay in the same place for an hour and, and 10 minutes, then it is the same if you're not wearing a mask. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a basically, you know, thumb in the nose at all the experts, which, of course, everybody hates these days, but the experts are right and we're paying for it in a way that we shouldn't be paying for it. And right. that is by keeping things shut down to some degree. When we come back, we'll uh, we'll review. Uh, well, we'll we'll talk about what the next couple of weeks uh, hold in store here, because you know there's always that convention bump. The virtual convention bump is it the same thing? I don't know. Joe will talk to us about that when we come back on uh, my state of my students. Back to my final chat segment here with Joe Camarano, professor of political science at at Providence College. Um, we've had the pollsters talk about the traditional bumps. Uh, I, I don't know what we're going to see, if, if, if any, uh, with two virtual campaigns, conventions, back to back. Uh, you mentioned the ratings. Interestingly enough, I mean, it must have gone up the president's wazoo to know that he was a couple million viewers shy uh, uh, on his night than Joe Biden was on his night, which I think I don't, I don't know what to make of that. What do you make of that? Well, I think I make, what I make of that is, again, I think people who love Trump tuned in, people who felt obliged tuned in, and nobody else did because they knew what they were going to get. And whether or not they're going to vote for him, they knew what they were getting, and they didn't want to you know, deal with it. So you know, it's about 15% lower than uh, Biden's, which is significant. But the ratings haven't been all that great for either of them. No. So, okay. What is your, what's your academic thought about what the virtuality of these two conventions uh, has done and will do comparative to how other convention seasons affected elections? Sure. Actually, you know, when you look at presidential campaigns, the ones who do things differently than the past are the ones who usually win. And, you know, both parties did things differently from the past. On the Republican side, this was much more of a personalized convention for Trump. On the Democratic side, they really finally tapped into the skills of their Hollywood allies and put together a really good series of infomercials uh, that I thought told a, a really interesting narrative that could be a model for the future. So I think both of them actually did something very unique. Um, I would put my money on the Democratic one being the, the closer to what's going to happen in the future, because um, conventions are already outdated. We don't need them anymore. We haven't needed them since 1976. Uh, and maybe this is the beginning of the end of the convention. You, you, really, think, you really think that the, the three or four day event for each party when, you know, God bless us, we get past this virus. You, you, think, you think that's over? I mean, it's not fully, no. No, no, no. People are dying to fill up Gillette Stadium again and the Ryan Center and the dunk and, and for concerts and ball games and shows and PPAC. And we all, I think we all crave the vision of gathering again. You don't think the, the conventions will, will be in that form as a, as a comeback statement for the virus and blah, blah, blah? I, I kind of expect them to become internal events rather than external events, meaning they're aimed at people in the party. It'll be a great gathering for fundraisers, for party activists, for delegates. But I don't think that people are going to tune in as much. And I don't think the networks are going to cover them as much. They're just not that interesting anymore. And remember, in 1964, they were fascinating. But, you know, look at all the things that have become more fascinating since then. So yeah, I think conventions are a thing in the past. Yeah, well, we have we've talked about that before. In that the conventions, it's not like the term brokered convention 
uh, kept coming up in the last two democratic cycles, but inevitably it all worked itself out and, and, and there wasn't going to be one. If there is no drama of a nomination contest, and there hasn't been in decades, right? So I, in a way, you're right. Everything's fait accompli. It's a show, and maybe the show's not as not as marketable anymore. In a way, in a way, it's kind of sad because for those of us who enjoy the the celebration of democracy through partisan politics, it, it'll leave a little bit of a hole. But for most of America, I guess it's just like yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, and you know, um, traditionally conventions have allowed the party to come together on a set of issues called a platform. And you know, the Democrats had 85 pages, but the Republicans said, oh yeah, look at 2016, we're gonna use the same one. Um, so even that has diminished. Um, and I just don't think that it's gonna be in the financial self-interest of, of major media companies to cover them the way they have been. <clears throat> It's always about that. All right, um, 30 seconds. What happens in the next couple of weeks? Anything of significance? Yeah, I, I think we all better sort of, those of you who are into praying, pray that we don't get violent in this country. Um, I, I actually am really seriously worried about increased tensions and the increased use of weapons. Um, and so, yeah, watch out for that and do your best not to be a part of that. <laughs> That's about all I have. And we'll, we'll leave Mr. Him. Optimistic, I know. Well, you know, if you'll, the political scientist looks like he's a little worn down by these two conventions uh, because uh, it, ain't your, it ain't your grandfather's political process anymore, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, I became a political scientist because I thought politics was a good thing and it's getting harder to see it that way. I'll leave it on that. Joe Camerano, political scientist at Providence College. Final word when we come back. Stay with us. Really some political science malaise from our guest, Joe Camerano. Understandably, this process can wear everybody down, whether you celebrate politics or not. Um, the thumbs up view on Donald Trump needs to be heard too, right? Tom Hodgson, the sheriff from Bristol County, will be my guest on the Friday show coming up uh, at the end of the week. And you may see some of these shows on a repeat basis. Uh, for production purposes, we will have some former shows on uh, Wednesday and Thursday night and back with a new show on Friday with uh, Sheriff Hodgson and his thoughts on Donald Trump. See you on the radio at 3 till 6 on WPRO. You have a great evening. Good night.